Hello, everybody. I'm Jack Tulse, and this is the Tuesday evening teaching time in our household. And so we're going to this night be covering the, at least the start of quantum faith. Now, it's, it's a, a little harder to grasp than just the normal teaching on healing. But I ask you to bear with me. I'll go slowly, give you some time to think about it. So let's start out with this. You all know Charles Caps, don't you? The person who is uh, known for the words that we speak. He's, he's very careful about the words he speaks. He's with the Lord right now. But I'm saying that he has written several books about words and how we have to be careful about those words that we speak. Well, he has a daughter named Annette. And Annette has been interested in quantum mechanics for years. So a few years ago, I think it was maybe five years ago or so, she wrote a book, a little one. I'll hold it up here. Yeah, it's backwards to you probably. It's called Quantum Faith. Quantum Faith. And it's Annette Caps. And it's a 32-page booklet. And when I read it, it was fascinating. And I taught it for a little bit to our, our home group. And then I asked the Lord, Lord, is there more? And he said to me, go to the internet. And I did. And wow, the things I found. Mm -hmm. So I was able to put together a 12-page study on it. Now, I'm not going to cover all of it tonight. It's impossible. Uh, there's just too much. And I want to take these concepts slowly. And so tonight we may get through three pages. And if not, that's okay too. Because I want you to catch on to this, grasp this, because it has very great significance to your Christian walk, to your health, to the miracles that you will receive if you use this. So it's very important to understand. That's why I'm going to go slowly. First of all, <clears throat> I'm going to be reading off this 12-page summary here, but I want you to also take your Bibles because this is heavily dependent on the Word of God. So we're going to start out with Hebrews 11, verse 1. Hebrews 11, verse 1, and then verse 3. Hebrews 11. You can probably quote that by heart. Here it is. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it says faith is a substance. It's not nothing. It's something. Over in verse 3, it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, folks, I want to read this in this manner. The first words are, through faith we understand. That doesn't mean that we believe by faith. No, no. Through faith. Then, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Through faith. God used faith to frame the worlds. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So this doesn't have a thing to do with our faith. It has to do with his faith. We could also say that we understand that through faith, God framed the word, the world. That's the intention of that, that scripture. And so <clears throat> a quantum is a tiny packet of energy, very small. You can't see it. Of course, you can't see any energy because it's it, until it manifests as mass. 
Now, there's a distinction between the macro world and the micro world as we know it. First of all, when I say macro, I mean the normal world, world that we live in, that we see all the time. If you take, a, say, an apple and drop it on the floor, it falls at 32 feet per second squared. And if my dear wife takes that same apple, picks it up, now it's a little softer, and she drops it on the floor, the same thing happens. It falls at the same speed and acceleration. Now, this doesn't happen in the micro world. In the macro world, things are independent of the observer. Independent. In the micro world, they are not. Think about that a little. Now, let's just supposing, you know, you've had one of these Rubik's Cubes, probably. You play with that maybe 30 years ago that came out. But just supposing that there is an atom at each corner of the Rubik's Cube. And this atom is attracted to the other atoms in that cube. And also the other atoms are attracted to it. So there's attraction there. Now think about this. The Rubik's Cube represents our bodies. Our bodies are mostly space. They are not solid. But every atom is attracted to every other atom in the body. Now think what would happen if the spaces between those atoms were shrunk down to zero. Well, I weigh approximately 200 pounds. So in my body, if the spaces between my atoms shrunk to zero, I would still weigh 200 pounds, but I would be the size of the tip of my little finger because all that space would be collapsed. Now think about what would happen in the other direction if those spaces were increased. This is what would happen as the spaces between those atoms were increased in your body. The first thing that would happen is you would walk through walls. And an object, a solid object, could pass through your body without you feeling it. If the spaces continue to increase between your atoms, the next thing that would happen is you would disappear. People could not see you. You're still there. You're still there. Your spirit, your soul, your body, but your body is dispersed so that nobody can see it. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus in Luke 4 and John 8 when the people wanted to kill him. They wanted to throw him over the cliff in Luke 4. And suddenly he vanished. Now they had a hold of him. They were bringing him toward the cliff face. And suddenly he was gone. The spaces between his atoms increased and they lost him. <laughs> The same thing happened in John 8, verse 59. He was teaching them in the temple, and they didn't like what he taught. So they picked up stones to throw at him, and it says Jesus hid himself, and passing through the middle of them went his way. He did the same thing there. He increased the spaces between his atoms, and lo and behold, they couldn't find him to stone him. And then, then when that happens, I am thinking about John 14, verse 12, and you should be too. John 14, 12 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. So have you done that recently? I trust not. Neither have I. But Jesus said, we're able, we're capable of it. Okay. 
Okay, now I've I've gone through this whole study and I'm going through it point by point. The total study of 12 pages involves 43 paragraphs. And I've already covered one and two. Here's number three. You might want to just write down these things so that you can find yourself and your notes at the next time. Number three, words are energy, and energy affects matter. Example. Microwave oven. We all have them now. And when you put a cup of water in there and you hit the switch to turn on the microwave energy, the microwave energy vibrates at a higher frequency than the water. And so that higher frequency excites the electrons in the water. Water is H2O, right? One hydrogen atom and two oxygen. Uh, pardon me, two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen. There we go. And so each hydrogen atom, we'll just say, has one nucleus, a, a neutron, a proton there, and has one electron around it. When that microwave energy hits it, it's excited. And instead of vibrating at a low frequency, suddenly it vibrates at a higher. Now, what happens to that electron? That electron, which has been orbiting the nucleus, okay, we'll just say at one inch. Now, that's ridiculous, but anyway, just as an example, it's one inch around the nucleus. All of a sudden, when the microwave hits it, it goes out to 12 inches, vibrates out there, circles the nucleus. Why? Because it took energy to get it from the low orbit around the nucleus to the high orbit. It took energy. And so when that happens, then each molecule is sped up by the atoms. They're excited. They excite the molecules. The molecules exert friction on each other. The friction produces heat. Lo and behold, you have your hot water for whatever your need is. Yeah. So the molecules, now you can do the opposite too. You can, you can freeze it, put it in the refrigerator, put your cup of water in there. And what happens is that instead of the excitement Moving the electron to a higher orbit, it moves it to a lower because things are calming down now. In fact, in fact, you are depriving that molecule or that atom of energy. You're taking energy out of it. When you take energy out of it, the electron moves from a high orbit to a lower orbit. And eventually, your water will freeze if it's in the, the freezer compartment, of course. So the water will freeze. And by the way, our words work the same way because words are energy. Now, if you speak to a situation and you speak positive words, guess what? The positive energy takes over and things begin to happen that are positive. If you speak negative words, the same thing occurs, but the negative results occur. Why is this? Because, folks, I'm going to give you two principles of creation here that God, God created. And I'm going to use the term the old creation because God is recreating by his power. And we our recreated spirits were the new creation. The Bible speaks about that in Ephesians and in Colossians. We're the new man. Man, not gender related at all. New mankind. We're new. As a spirit man, we're new. There never was one like us before. 
That's the new creation. So you'll understand when I speak of the old creation that I'm talking about the original creation with Adam and Eve and the animals and all that. Okay. So in the old creation, which God spoke into being with his vibrating voice, he called something that wasn't as though it were, and it became. Now, a living God doesn't make dead things. A living God makes living things. This is principle number one. God made everything alive. He made the stones alive. He made the soil alive. He made the animals alive. Everything, every single thing is alive. You say, oh, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. I can prove it to you from the Word of God. <laughs> Over in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13. 1 Timothy 6, 13. I found this a while ago, and it really thrilled me. It, it just made good sense in the light of quantum mechanics. It says, this is the word now. Fight the good fight of faith, that's verse 12. Lay hold on eternal life unto which also you are called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. Verse 13, here it is. I command you in the sight of God who makes all things alive and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. God made everything alive. Everything. Now, principle number two, he made everything responsive to faith. Because God lives by faith. Jesus lives by faith. You say, well, he doesn't need to. He can do anything. God has faith in you. He doesn't force you to do anything. He exercises his faith. Over in Hebrews 10, 13, it says that Jesus is using his faith. What for? For God to put everything under his feet. But God doesn't work alone. That means that we work with him. So we're going to help. We and God are going to put everything under Jesus' feet. That's a new thought probably to you. <clears throat> Number four. We are created in God's image, it says, over in Genesis 1, verse 26. And are creative, because he is creative. The angels were not made in God's image. They are not creative. Man was made higher than the angels. If you read over in Psalm 8, it says, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you've visited him? You've made him a little lower than Elohim is what the Hebrew says, not angels. Elohim is the word for God. We were made a little lower than God. And also over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it talks about Paul is saying, don't you know that we're going to judge angels? Well, God never has a lesser creature judge a greater. Never. The greater always judges the lesser. So there's a couple of proofs there. So if we're made like God, a little lower than God, we are, we are creative in nature. And I think no one will dispute that because there are creative arts, creative sciences. A hundred years ago, no one knew anything about nuclear physics. But today, that's a science. It's a great science. And then hundreds of years ago, during the Renaissance, Michelangelo painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. That was a mighty creative work. So we are made like God in that respect. We have his creativity in us. 
All right, now let's discuss the behavior of the micro world. We discussed the macro. Now we're going to discuss the micro world. Now, supposing that we have a cloud of hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen gas, the atoms. Okay, now we're going to take a microscope, an electron microscope, and look into that cloud. At first, we see you can't see a particle in there at all. It's, they exist, the electrons are there in a wave form. They aren't a particle. So you see nothing until you observe it through the microscope. And then you see the particle appear. Each atom has an electron, and each electron is a particle now. It's in particle form. Now, you might ask me the question, well, Jack, how does it know it's being watched? Good question. Good question. <laughs> it's alive. It's alive. That's how it knows it's being watched. But now, supposing you take another observer, and he looks through that electron microscope, and he sees the particle also, but it's behaving differently for him. It's not behaving the same, it's changing its orbit. Whereas the first man saw it in one orbit, the second man sees it in a different one. Why? And if you bring a third person along, it'll be still different. Why is this? That's funny behavior. It's because. The behavior of the electron depends on the observer. Could it be that the observers have different kinds of faith? Aha. Uh -huh. One has more faith than another. One has lesser faith. And so the electron responds to the faith of the observer. That's interesting. Remember, God made every particle in this universe responsive to faith now i'm not i'm not speaking only of electrons i'm speaking of sub electron particles so tiny that they're called quarks and muons and gluons and those things that we never learned when i was in in high school or college because that was still in the future and so these are the smallest things now but they respond to the faith of the observer. Okay, number five, paragraph five of the 43. All matter is alive and responds to faith and words. I just showed you from the scripture. A living God makes living things. Now, how do we know this from the Bible? Well, in the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, Luke 19, verse 40, gives us a clue. Luke 19, verse 40, says the following. And he answered, that's Jesus, and said unto them, I tell you, if these should hold their peace, talking about the children, the stones would immediately cry out. I didn't think stones cried out. <laughs> but the Lord says, they're living. They can cry out. Now, you might not be able to hear them. The frequency might be too high for our ears to hear. But they would cry. They'd cry out. Remember the stone of witness that Joshua put up in Joshua chapter 24, verse 27? I, you don't have to turn there, but just note down the reference. He said, this stone has heard all the words of the covenant that you've made with God. 
this stone has heard. So stones can cry out and they can hear. How about that? Wow. Over in Isaiah 55, verse 12, it says, The mountains and the hills will shake their hands. Yeah. It says they will run, you know. And let me just quote that. Isaiah 55, verse 12. These things are fascinating, folks. They're in the Word of God. And we never thought about this earlier. Isaiah 55, verse 12. It says, For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Because they're living. They aren't dead. They're alive. Just like you're alive. Okay, let's go on. The Word of God in Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the word of God is alive. The word of God is alive. Yeah. Before you. The word of God in the Bible doesn't have power. But when you take that word and you put it in you and you speak it, it has power, great power, Amen. great power and authority. And it's living and it will accomplish Amen. what you say. Hallelujah. Amen. Paragraph seven. A redeemed person. I'm talking now about the new man. Is a king and a priest unto God. How does the king rule? Now, this is found in Revelation 5, verse 10. I won't read it to you. But a king rules in one way, by words. He speaks words. And the words that come out of his lips become laws in that land. That's how he rules that land, by words. Words have energy. And they change situations. Number eight. Thoughts and beliefs produce an aura around us. Oh, oh, Jack, you've used the wrong word. That's new age stuff. Don't you know better than that? <laughs> they stole it from us. <laughs> it's originally ours. It produces a zone of influence around us. We call that an aura. And your thoughts and your beliefs produce that. And other people notice it. If you, believing in the Lord and trusting in him, born again, if you walk into a bar somewhere, heads are going to turn. They feel that someone has walked in that is not of their zone of influence. Is not like them. It's because we carry that aura of the Lord with us wherever we go. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Paragraph nine. Things obey words. That's right. They do. Jesus stilled the storm. Remember that? Over in Luke 8, verse 24 and 25. Let's quickly turn there. Luke chapter 8, verse 24 and 25. Here it is. And they came to him, that's the disciples, and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Wow, those are bad words. <laughs> We're going to die. Do something. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. Then he turned to them, he said to them, Where is your faith? In other words, they could have done it. 
Why did they wake him up? He needed to sleep. That's what he was really saying. You could have done this. Why didn't you? Where's your faith? Yeah. Another example of, from our time. I'm going to tell you this, not in a boastful banner at all, but this happened to me in 1998. I was flying from Los Angeles International Airport to Palmdale in a little twin otter. Flyers know what that is. It's a twin propeller airplane, holds 18 passengers. And as we approached the mountains, San Gabriel Mountains, we went into a snowstorm. And it was rough. The plane bucked and, and tilted and went all over the sky. Boy, it was awful. I looked at the patch on the pilot's arm because the, this was before 9-11 and the cockpit was open. I could see his arm patch. It said Iceland. I said, well, this guy's used to flying in winter weather. <laughs> no, no problem. But it was uncomfortable. His stomach didn't feel good. I said, hey, I don't have to put up with this. Under my breath, I said, Storm, you stop. Turbulence, you stop right now in the name of Jesus. I command you. And folks, you may not believe this, but it did right then. There was no more turbulence, none. And we were right over the mountains. The snow was still blowing. The airplane was still flying through the snow, but it was smooth. That was something that I never forgot. We have power to still a storm. Since then, winds which would have blown our trees onto our house. All you have to do is go out there and speak in the name of Jesus with faith, and you tell the wind how fast it can blow. That's right. That's not presumption. That's faith. All right. All right, we're going to take a new paragraph here. Paragraph 10. Every object has its own frequency of vibration. It is not solid. Your, your dining room table has a frequency of vibration, and it's composed of all these little subatomic particles all vibrating themselves at their own frequencies. And when you combine all those frequencies, then you get the table vibrating at its frequency. That's the frequency of the, of the macro, <laughs> the big table. Paragraph 11. Think now. God's words are the highest frequency spoken in the universe. God's words are the highest frequency. That means they have the most power, the most energy, because energy depends on the frequency it's spoken at. A low frequency energy doesn't have much power. But as you move up the spectrum, a spectrum is a, is a line which depicts the power of different things like sound and light and x-rays and gamma rays and the kingdom of God. Going from low frequency to high frequency. Are you following this? Think of the line, a spectrum. And think of over here, low energy. That sound. Then you come over here to light. That's higher, higher frequency, higher energy. Then you go over here to X rays. That's still higher. Then you go over here to gamma rays, and I'm off the screen. <laughs> then you go over here to the kingdom of God. That's the highest. 
And when God speaks, it's the most energy of all. It's the highest. You can say, oh, yeah, but we can't do that. Listen, Jesus made it possible for us to speak God's words. We can speak God's words. And the same thing will happen when we speak them with faith that happens when God speaks them. Because those words are in the spiritual realm. And the spiritual realm has dominion over the natural realm. The spirit of man has dominion over his body. You have dominion over your body. Especially the new creation man. In the new creation, you have authority over every cell in your body. You can command those cells to do whatever Amen. you want them to do. Amen. You can heal yourself that way. I'm not I'm not speaking weird stuff now and I'm not speaking new age I'm speaking kingdom of God and the word of God what he has taught us in the word who we are and our authority in Jesus Christ we don't have to put up with sickness we can drive it out of our Amen. bodies and keep our bodies healthy That's right. That's right. you know it says over in Hebrews 8 verse 6 the new covenant is better than the old in the old covenant, God healed everybody. What could be better? Not getting sick. That's better. And you can prevent yourself from being sick. Although sometimes we make ourselves sick. I know we do. I did it one time and, and asked God, Lord, what is this? I've been rebuking it and rebuking it. And he said, I can't heal you. I said, what? Yes, you can. You can do that. He said, I can. But he said, you make yourself sick again. I said, what am I doing? He says, you're staying up too late night watching TV, and you're getting up early to pray. And I appreciate the prayers, but you're making yourself sick. <laughs> and he did. I mean, he, he told me that. And I saw right away. I said, Father, you're right. I got to change my, my lifestyle. I must change. And I will. This day, I'm going to change my lifestyle. Then I said, sickness, get off my body. And it did right away. Wow. It was gone. I felt healthy yeah. and strong. Yeah. I wanted to eat right away. So this is just one way that you can keep yourself healthy. So God's words are high frequency. They're highest of all. Paragraph 12, we're moving on, as you can see. I want to draw an analogy, a likeness, between the kingdom of God and the natural kingdom as satellites of the earth. That's right. Here's the earth, my fist. All right? This is my fist. Now, a satellite of the earth, in the, if we say we're in the natural kingdom, then you launch from the earth, you go up into orbit close to my fist. We'll call it a 300 nautical mile orbit close to the, the fist. That's the natural kingdom. Now, where's God's kingdom? Way out here. Way out here. Why? Because it takes energy to get from the close orbit, to the far orbit out here. Why? You're fighting gravity all the way. Does that make sense? You're fighting gravity. So it takes yes. more energy to get up there, right? Yes. That's God's kingdom. It takes energy to get there. You don't get there automatically. You have to use your faith. Faith is energy. And it's expressed by your words. All right, now think of, you remember the big Saturn V rocket, which l launched uh, uh, the guys to the moon, Neil, Neil Armstrong and Aldrin uh, launched those guys, three men. To think of it this way. 
that the rocket represents faith. That's your faith to bring you from one point to another higher, right? But it won't go anywhere if it doesn't have fuel. Over in Galatians 5, verse 6, it says that faith works by love. Ah, that's the fuel. Love. Love is the fuel of faith. The rocket represents faith. The love represents the fuel. But if you launch now, now you've got faith and love. You go straight up, right? What would happen if you... He launched the Saturn V straight up, way up there. You know what would happen? Come straight down. Why? You need guidance to guide it into an orbit parallel to the Earth, parallel to the surface of the Earth. That's the Holy Spirit. So the rocket is your faith. The fuel for that rocket is love, and the guidance is the Holy Spirit. Now you can go into orbit, into the yeah. kingdom of God. <laughs> yeah, it's just an analogy, that's all. Just an analogy. Okay, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And by the way, that really would happen to a rocket. Just what I said. You got to guide the thing in, into orbit. That's why when you watch it on TV, you see it start up straight and then it goes over like this. And eventually it's going to be parallel to the surface of the earth. Right. Okay. Paragraph 13. Hey, we're making great, great headway. <laughs> uh, okay, this is probably the last one uh, for tonight because there's a lot more to go. 43 paragraphs, but uh, very interesting stuff. Because you can see it goes right to your your Bible, the, the Word of God, and the Word of God is personified in this. Here we go. In the subatomic arena, there are only possibilities and probabilities because before you look at these little tiny particles, before you look, they're just a mass. I mean, they are not particles. They're in waveform. It's like you're looking at a cloud. You can't see a thing in a cloud, like in a fog. You drive your car in the fog. You can't see anything, right? That's how it is. Anything is possible in that cloud. Anything. Jesus said, Mark 9, 23, if you can believe all things are possible, to him that believes. What you have to do is go into that cloud of possibilities, select the one you want, and pull it out. Think about it. Go into the possibilities cloud, select the one you want, and pull it out, and speak it into existence. That's not weird. That's the way quantum mechanics operates. All right, let's spend just a couple minutes more. Paragraph 14. Where does hope exist? What is hope, you know? Well, if you can think of this, Again, I'm going to use my fist. This time it's going to represent my spirit. My spirit inside my body. All right? And around it is my soul, which is my emotions, my will, and my intellect, my mind. That's around it. And then around that is my body, which you're looking at. That's my body. So we got a threefold. We're created in threefold, right? A body, a soul, and a spirit. Okay. Now, hope requires patience. Hope is of the soul. Is of the soul. But faith is from your spirit, the inner man, the 
the inside man. That's what generates faith. Hope is of the soul. Right? Okay. Faith is of the human spirit. The, uh, let me give a, a, some scripture on that. Hope is of the soul, Hebrews 6, 19. Hebrews 6, verse 19. Now, hope isn't wrong. You must have hope. Right? The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. So hope is built by faith. <laughs> right? So hope isn't wrong. You build hope with your faith. It's just like um, if I can use the picture of a new house being constructed, right? The blueprint for the house is hope, right? Now you go and you buy the materials and you stack them up. That's faith. It costs you something. Faith costs you a lot, right? Now you can take that plan of hope and you can build with the materials. Okay, hallelujah. Well, we'll cover more on this same thing next time. But next time is going to be a couple of weeks away. And uh, <laughs> uh, my dear wife probably would like to also continue teaching on, uh, on healing. It's all part of the kingdom of God. We're teaching kingdom here. This is kingdom of God 101. <laughs> Who we really are in Christ. What we can do in him. And how we see the world in him. We should be walking like Jesus in the earth. Amen. We should be able to do everything he did. He said we could. John 14, 12. He said, the things I do shall you do also. But it takes faith. Right? So we're going to quit for tonight. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks. God bless you all. May you practice those things you've heard today. And may it change your life. May it change the way you operate. Change the way you talk. Change the way you think. Change everything in your life for the better. For the new creation Amen. man Amen. is who you are in Christ. Okay, God bless you all. You can pray for them. Bye bye. Oh, yeah, I'm going to pray for you. Let me pray for you. I'm going to extend my hand toward the screen. Father, in the name of Jesus, all of those who heard me tonight explain about quantum faith and about how quanta operate, in the name of Jesus, let them understand. Let it come into their mind clearly. Let there be no cloud. No misunderstanding. And let them practice what they heard tonight. I bless them in the name of Jesus. Let them not forget, Lord. Let their minds be good and strong and retain all this knowledge. This is spiritual knowledge. In the name of Jesus, I pray for you. And you are blessed. Who I bless is blessed in Jesus' name. So good night. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you.